Well, for months, our investigative team has been looking into the Murdoch investigation. In our newest episode of our podcast, we go down the Paul Murdoch rabbit hole. It involves Mallory Beach's family, Parker's gas stations, and a PI hired to watch Paul's every move before he died. Parker's is accused of selling alcohol to Paul Murdoch before the crash that killed Mallory Beach. The PI tells Ariane Emerson what she had to do to get close to Paul. It's a story you'll only see on ABC News 4. Hey, Ann. Hey, well, there is a photo of this private investigator with a young woman, and the attorney for Mallory Beach's family claims a private investigator, Sarah Capelli, was buying alcohol for minors. He even brought it up to a judge, and that PI refutes the claims and provided me with a timeline. One thing. The Beach family attorney, Mark Tinsley, told the judge, as he understood it, this PI was hired by Parkers to get video of Paul Murdoch drinking, partying, and talking about killing that girl. That girl Tinsley refers to is 19-year-old Mallory Beach. Parkers is being sued by Mallory Beach's family after she was killed in a boat crash. State prosecutors said Paul Murdoch was drunk and behind the wheel. He was murdered before the case went to trial. Tinsley told the judge the PI broke the law during her Ashton undercover investigation of Paul. He said significantly one of the things this PI did was she bought alcohol for some underage people in Columbia in order to get information about Paul Murdoch. I asked the PI if that was true. That there was some kind of that you were involved in in supplying alcohol to an underage person during your during your surveil. What do you take from that? This is our rumors that this is alleged. It's a selfie and a private party that I gained access to just like anyone else in there. But I don't know how to explain that. I would simply state that he has no concrete evidence because I had not been court ordered to turn it over. So where is he coming up with this? I've seen the Snapchat selfie. It's a photo of the PI smiling with a young woman. Tinsley believes the photo was taken in November 2020, before she was working for Parkers. However, the PI says that photo was taken months later at a private Super Bowl party. She was there to get information about Paul. He was not there. She says everyone was carded. Tell me what you have been court ordered to turn over. Can you tell me that? I have been subpoenaed for all evidence to include uh, video. Uh, reports, timelines, background research used during the course of the investigation, uh, tracker reports based on vehicles to locate and document the scope of my assignment, um, invoicing, receipts, my contract, you know, valid evidence, everything and anything that related to my case. Well, and tomorrow we will drop a new episode of Unsolved South Carolina, Murdoch Murders, Money and Mystery. You will hear exclusively from this PI. She tells us about her work as a female detective, what she was doing when she was following Paul, and what she hopes will be revealed. I can't come in here with my cardiac service off. I told you. Thank you. Okay, you just not block our Okay, I won't, so thank you. Well, that's video taken last Sunday on King Street. The woman recording that video says she and her service dog were denied entry into a downtown store. Floriana Boardman spoke with both the store owner in that video and the woman recording. She tells us exactly what happened. Floriana? Hey, Tessa. Jessica Paulson tells me she goes everywhere with her service dog, Henry. But this past weekend, when visiting Charleston with her family, she ran into some unexpected issues when shopping on King Street. Jessica Paulson tells us she's had her cardiac service dog, Henry, for five years. It's me and Henry, always. Like, there's no me without him. <laughs> yeah, he's been all over the world with me, and I couldn't have gone anywhere without him. She says she's only been denied entry to a location because of Henry once before. But it happened a second time last weekend on King Street. Paulson says the store chocolate by Adam Taroni turned Jessica and Henry away. He's never not with me. Like ever, um, he goes to work with me. He's been, I mean, that's how essential it is. Like, I'm not, there's no, there, I, there's no me going in the chocolate store without him. So by her denying Henry, she was absolutely denying me. Store co-founder Alexander Julio de Taylor claims Henry was not acting like a proper service dog. 
She says Henry was tugging at his owner's leash, giving her the ability to tell Henry and Jessica to leave. According to the ADA website, a person with a disability cannot be asked to remove his service animal from the premise unless, quote, one, the dog is out of control and the handler does not take effective action to control it, or two, the dog is not housebroken. Paulson is calling for more awareness about service dogs. If you have a truly trained service dog for a medical condition, there's no way to fake it. But if you have just a regular dog that, you know, you're just pretending as a service dog, I mean, you pretty, you pretty easily fall out of being covered by the law. Now, there are two questions store owners are legally able to ask service dog owners. One, if the service dog is required because of a disability and what task the dog has been trained to perform. Well, in a matter of weeks, many people in the low country will be out of a job. We've been telling everybody at home about Borden Dairy's plans to shut down a facility in North Charleston. And new tonight, we're speaking with workers to find out what's next. Harrison Clark has a one on one you'll only see on ABC News 4. Alan Klein has been a Borden employee for a total of eight years, but come next month, he'll be on the market for a new job. Devastating, honestly. Uh, you, I don't know what's going to happen next. It's, it's going to be an adventure. Klein's first reaction was shock. He was heading to work for his overnight shift when a coworker texted him about the shutdown. The company says it's offering a severance package. Workers like Klein are trying to figure out what that looks like. For me, this go round, I've been at the company just under three years, so I won't get too terrible much. Klein's concern goes beyond himself. The people who've been here 10, 20, even 30 years, and they are not compensating them worth a darn, like hardly anything for, for what we've done. A group of workers who stayed on through tough times. We've worked completely through the pandemic, never closed the doors through hurricane storms, just did the best job we could with what we had. Others like Brian Rue, a warehouse supervisor, have a family to think about. Got to find another job to help support my family, you know, so you know, I have two young ones at home, so I got to take care of everything. Now it's all about figuring out what's next. Well, once the doors actually close, it's going to be another hunt for, for work. You know, I got another month and a half or so here, so I got some time, but it's still hard to find something, so we're just out there looking.